Um, I'm going to talk about the manipulation of exchange bias by a spin orbital torque. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, ferromagnetic uh, layers sandwiched by two uh, uh, heavy metals. Um, so here you can see that how the uh, spin orbital torques um, switch the uh, ferromagnetic layers. And later on, we actually replace one of the uh, heavy metals by an uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, it has been known that the, the interface play a very important role for uh, spin orbital torque. And here, because we uh, uh, add in the antiferromagnet, so you would expect to see the exchange bias uh, established uh, in the system. And I'm going to show you by using the spin orbital torque, uh, we can not only uh, switch the ferromagnetic layers, but also we can actually switch the exchange bias. And the, uh, we have been uh, uh, working on the antiferromagnetic uh, spintronics, but uh, one of the challenges to understand how the uh, spin structure look like uh, in the antiferromagnet. So I hope that uh, by using this kind of exchange bias, we can have more uh, information about uh, the interfacial spins uh, at the interface, especially we talk about uh, uh, the platinum and cobalt and the eluding magnets system. Okay, so let me uh, uh, just uh, give you the, uh, uh, the behavior we can observe for the uh, uh, cobalt layers sandwiched by two uh, platinum layers. So we measure the uh, effective field by the harmonic uh, measurements. So you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, a significant uh, uh, effective field for the longitudinal direction, and, but the, quite a small along the transverse direction. So we think we have a, a spin hole effect dominating uh, uh, in this kind of system. But the, at the first, we thought, oh, well, this is sort of uh, uh, quite a, a symmetric structure. So you can imagine that if we have a spin current coming from the bottom platinum, we should also have the spin current from the top platinum. So it should be canceled out. Uh, but from the, uh, uh, the, the sign of the uh, uh, effective field, we know that uh, we have a more spin current from the top. And it can be uh, understood by the, uh, uh, the order of uh, uh, the, the, the layer structure. Uh, because of the uh, quite a different at atomic weight for cobalt and the platinum. So at the, the bottom interface, we actually deposit the cobalt on top of the platinum. So the, in the interf interface intermixing is uh, much less. On the other hand, if we deposit the platinum on top of the cobalt, you can imagine that uh, we induce quite a severe intermixing. So although the structure-wise, it looks like a symmetric, but indeed, we have a very different interface. And it has been known the uh, uh, so-called the interface transparency is quite critical for spin current passing through the structures. So we believe that's because of this kind of uh, different uh, interface structure so that we have a more spin current coming from the top through this uh, uh, interface. Okay, now as I mentioned that uh, we actually can use the uh, uh, the platinum to switch the cobalt layers. And then we actually would like to uh, introduce the eluding magnets to replace one of the platinum layers. Okay, so let me give a very short uh, uh, kind of uh, review for the exchange bias. We typically have uh, uh, two ways to build the uh, exchange bias. One way is to uh, deposit uh, the uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic uh, layers uh, with the presence of the magnetic field, by, for example, by sputtering. So when we apply the external magnetic field, we can actually ally the uh, uh, magnetization of the ferromagnet layers. So when we deposit antiferromagnet on top of the ferromagnet layers, we automatically build the uh, uh, exchange bias. Another way is that uh, we actually deposit the uh, bilayers without the field but then later on we do the field annealing above the annealed temperature, then do the field cooling, so we can also establish the exchange bias. And so you can see that uh, uh, if you use these two ways, if you would like to switch the direction of the exchange bias, you have to raise the temperature above the so-called blocking temperature and give the external field to switch 
the exchange bias. Okay, so here I first show you the uh, magnetic properties of our S deposit films. And as I mentioned that uh, we insert the uh, eroding magnets uh, between uh, two platinum. In fact, uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, see that the, 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 the interface right now is very different. We have the interface for the cobalt and the eroding magnets. And then we, you can see that uh, we have uh, two dual loops shifted uh, to both sides. And this can be understood because uh, uh, when we first deposit the cobalt on top of the platinum, it uh, establishes a very strong perpendicular anisotropy. However, positive direction and negative direction are equivalent. So we have two kinds of identical domains in the cobalt. So later on, when we deposit eroding magnets on top of the cobalt, eroding magnets interface spins can see two kinds of uh, different cobalt domains. So it turns out you can see that uh, they have two kinds of uh, exchange coupling at the interface. That's why automatically they built two kinds of uh, shifted uh, loops in the S deposit field. Um, then we do the SOT switching curve. We actually use a focus smoke on the bar structure. The dimension is uh, five times 10 micron square. And we apply the external imprint field, 300 Ersted. So you can see that uh, we saw a quite a typical uh, uh, SOT uh, switching curve. And based on the polarity of the switching curve, we know that the, the, the major spin kernel actually coming from the bottom. Uh, remember that uh, without uh, uh, eroding magnets, we actually have the spin kernel coming from the top. And here we especially uh, increase the uh, thickness of the proton. So at the first we saw, oh, maybe we should have uh, some of uh, uh, spin kernel coming from the top, but uh, based on the uh, SOT switching polarity, we know that the, the major spin kernel, in fact, from the bottom of the, the proton. So, Compared to the uh, samples without the eroding magnets, we already see actually it's actually different. As I mentioned that the, the interface is very different. So it seems to us right now, uh, with the presence of the eroding magnets, the spin current generated from the top platinum, in fact, uh, uh, does not uh, have such a big effect on the uh, uh, ferromagnetic cobalt layers. Okay, now, so we would like to understand uh, how the eroding magnets uh, affect the uh, spin current. So we actually change the thickness of uh, eroding magnets. So we can see that uh, with increasing the thickness of the eroding magnets to the four nanometer, we start to see the change of the size for the effective field, which means uh, without the eroding magnets, we know that the, the spin current coming from the top platinum but uh, with increasing the thickness of uh, eroding magnets, the uh, uh, spin current from the bottom platinum become more significant. So it seems to us the eroding magnets itself blocking the spin current from the top platinum, okay? And uh, um, you may know that the uh, eroding magnets itself can generate the spin current. So you may argue that uh, should we also consider the spin current from the eroding magnets? In fact, in our case, uh, we think that the effect is small because the uh, resistivity of the eroding magnets is much larger than the platinum. And this is a sort of uh, current in parallel into the uh, different layers. So the current going, going through the eroding magnets layer is much, much smaller than the other layers. So even those uh, spin current generated in the eroding magnets is uh, uh, quite small compared to the uh, uh, spin current generated from the platinum. We also did uh, the uh, uh, switching uh, curve. You can also see the polarity change when we have uh, uh, thicker eroding magnets. I would like to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, we actually also uh, define so-called SOT efficiency by using the HK divided by ZHC. If we compare the uh, uh, samples with eight or 10 nanometer eroding magnet thickness, we in fact find that uh, the SOT efficiency in this kind of system is even bigger than the system without 
uh, interferon magnet. That could be one of the advantages by using this uh, Udi magnet uh, uh, coupled to the uh, ferro magnet. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you how we use uh, uh, SOT to uh, switch the uh, uh, exchange bias. So this is the uh, initial state. We, have, uh, we actually can use a fuel cooling or we actually can do the SOT switching to make the only one uh, shifted the loops. And we just uh, carry on the typical SOT switching. So you can see that originally the magnetization is uh, uh, positive. After we apply the uh, positive current, the magnetization switch to the negative as we uh, expect. But uh, you can see clearly the exchange bias change the sign from the negative to positive, which tells us that uh, the, uh, the spin current does not only switch the magnetization of the fer ferromagnetic layers, but also change the interfacial spins in the eluding magnets. That's why we can see the, uh, the loop shift change to the other side. Um, if we actually uh, uh, apply the uh, negative current, we can see again the exchange bias loop uh, shift from the positive to negative. If the current direction is not uh, the right direction, in fact, we don't see any change at all, just like uh, in the typical ferromagnetic uh, case. Okay, so in the original structure, we also have the tendon as the adhesion layer and tendon as the uh, uh, capping layer. So people may argue that, uh, well, could the tendon also give us some uh, very complicated spin current in the structure? So to identify what, what is the dominating uh, spin current, we actually change all the tendon uh, with the titanium. Titanium is well known, uh, very small, or even negligible uh, 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 spin hole angle. So you can know that uh, in this kind of system, it's a much uh, clean system. We all have, the only spin current we think is from the platinum. Okay. And um, in this kind of case, you can also see that uh, um, we, we do see very similar uh, behavior just like we had before. Even now, we don't have uh, top platinum at all. In fact, uh, we also change the uh, different uh, interferon magnet. For example, we use uh, ion magnets, and we change the, the button layer from the platinum to palladium. So ideally, we, as long as we have a spin current source, for example, here is a platinum, and uh, we have a perpendicular exchange bias, then we can always see you can use the uh, spin orbital torque to switch the exchange bias. Okay, so you may argue that, uh, well, could this be possible due to the uh, uh, dual heating? Because as I, 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 I described earlier, if we raise the temperature with external field, we actually have the chance to switch the uh, exchange bias. Okay, so we on purpose to change the ferromagnet to the cobalt nickel because by using cobalt nickel, we can have a thicker uh, ferromagnetic layer to reduce the exchange bias. We also on purpose to select ion magnets because ion magnets has a, uh, the lower uh, blocking temperature compared to the eluding magnets. So if we have a significant uh, uh, contribution from the dual heating, we should be able to see significant effect in this kind of system. Okay, so uh, again, as I mentioned, as only as long as we have uh, spin currents also with uh, perpendicular exchange bias, we always can see this kind of uh, uh, the reverse of the exchange bias. Uh, and now, in fact, uh, I would like to show the uh, uh, dual heating is not the dominating factor. So we replace the platinum with the copper. And we know that the copper has uh, uh, very, very low or even uh, no uh, spin current uh, generation. So in this kind of uh, uh, devices, we believe we don't have uh, significant uh, spin current uh, in the system. And because uh, ion magnets itself also has a, a very low uh, spin hole angle. So we apply the, uh, the current, which can generate the same dual heating as a platinum into the system. 
So now you can see that uh, we start uh, from the positive uh, uh, magnetization, and then we actually apply the field uh, to the negative direction because uh, at the, the uh, zero field, we can actually have uh, two stable states. So if we apply the field, we can change the ferromagnetic layer to the opposite direction, but without uh, affecting the uh, interfacial spin of uh, 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 ion magnets. So if the dual heating is important, you can imagine that uh, when the, 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 the cur uh, current goes in, temperature goes up, then this uh, interfacial ion magnetic spin will see the magnetization of the cobalt nickel. And then this interfacial spin is going to change the direction. So we can use exchange bias direction to monitor if we have anything change for this interfacial ion magnet spins. Okay, now, so we apply the current into the system with a positive current. And you can see that uh, from the initial curve, uh, we are pretty sure this uh, cobalt nickel are uh, not uh, changed. So it's still maintained in the negative direction. From the, the exchange bias, you see that the exchange bias is unchanged, which means even we give the same kind of uh, uh, current density, dual heating the same, we don't see any kind of a change of the exchange bias, which means we don't change any uh, interfacial spin in the ferro, uh, ion magnets. It tells us that the dual heating is not the major factor here to switch the exchange bias. That's also true if we use a, a neg negative current. Okay, so we of course would like to know, well, do we really have uh, temperature rise? In fact, a lot of people talk about this for this uh, uh, SOT switching. So one way we do it is we actually measure the uh, uh, temperature dependence of the resistance. It's quite a good uh, uh, linear relationship. And then we on purpose to give a long pulse uh, measurement. So before end of the pulse, we pick the data for the resistance and we plot the resistance with the uh, strength of the, the current pulse. So from this kind of measurement, we can estimate the uh, temperature rise. It's uh, around uh, uh, 85 degrees C. In fact, that's a significant amount, but compared to the Bracken temperature of the eluding magnets, it's much smaller, which means the temperature rise itself cannot really reach the blocking temperature to reverse the exchange bias. And some people may argue that you probably would have the uh, overshooting of the current. And during that kind of overshooting, you may switch the uh, uh, interfacial spins. So we develop so-called the in-situ time-resolved resistance measurement, which we need to use the ultra-fast uh, IV module. Uh, in this kind of module, we can uh, uh, monitor the resistance during the show pulse apply. So for example, if we have a 10 microsecond, we can really monitor the uh, uh, resistance change. Uh, in fact, we don't see the overshooting. And uh, another concern people may have is, uh, could, could we have uh, uh, heat accumulation in the device? If that's the case, then we can actually see that after apply many, many pulses, you will start to see gradual increase of the background of the uh, uh, resistance change. But in fact, we don't see it, which means this system, uh, although we do see the temperature rise, but uh, that kind of temperature rise is much, much lower than the temperature for switching the uh, interfacial spins. Okay, so here I would like to show you, I think, uh, People think uh, we are pretty much uh, uh, familiar with the, the SOT switching in the ferromagnet. So for example, we need to apply external field, HX, to break the symmetry to see the, uh, uh, the, the switching of the ferromagnetic layers. But how about the, in the anti-ferromagnet? So we would like to use exchange bias to be the indicator to really understand what's going on in the interfacial spins of the anti-ferromagnet. So here, we actually use the cobalt nickel with eluding magnets. We on purpose, again, to use the so-called anti-parallel mode, which means 
we make the uh, field magnetic spin is anti-parallel to the eluding magnets interfacial spins. Okay, now, so this is the initial state. We have uh, magnetization in the negative direction. And then we don't apply any uh, HX. So you can imagine that we don't switch the uh, uh, ferromagnetic layers. So again, the, from the initial curve, we know magnetization of the ferromagnet uh, stay unchanged. However, you can see that the, the loop shifted to the other side without external field. So you already see that the, the switching of the ferromagnetic spins and the interfacial of anti-ferromagnetic spins are different. So for interfacial uh, anti-ferromagnetic spins, when we use a, a spin current, it may not require the external field. Okay, so this is for the uh, positive current. For negative cu current, that, that would be <coughs> the same. Okay, now, um, we in fact apply the HX. But this HS from this uh, switching polarity, you can see that uh, we don't change the magnetization of the cobalt nickel. So basically, we still maintain the magnetization at the, the uh, negative. So even we apply the uh, uh, external field, you can see that uh, we don't uh, see any difference in terms of the exchange bias, which means the interfacial spins seems not to be affected by the HX. But if we apply the uh, negative current now with uh, external field, you can see that uh, we should switch the uh, cobalt nickel. So basically, we change the magnetization from the negative to positive. And at the same time, we see the, 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 the loop shift as we described earlier. So from this kind of experiment, uh, it tells us that uh, the reverse of the interfacial spins depends on the field magnetic magnetization direction. We found that always this uh, interfacial spins follow the uh, magnetization of the ferromagnetic layers, regardless of the uh, H HX. So no matter you give the uh, positive HX or negative HX, it basically does not change the results. And the spin current, we believe, provide a very significant and uh, very critical disturbance for the interfacial spins. And this kind of disturbance align the interfacial spins uh, of the anti-ferromagnet with the uh, ferromagnetic uh, magnetization. And the next question we would like to answer is, uh, well, how far the, this uh, uh, spin current can go through the ferromagnetic layers? Because you can see our structure here, the, the uh, spin current generated in the platinum, and then passing through the ferromagnetic layers. It has to reach this interface to switch the uh, interfacial spins. So you can see that up to a two nanometer of uh, ferromagnetic layers, we can still see the fully switching of the ferromagnetic layers as well as the exchange bias. When the thickness of uh, ferromagnetic layer increased to uh, 2.7 nanometer, nanometers, uh, we start to see the partial switch of the ferromagnetic layers. But now we still see the switching of the exchange bias. <coughs> okay. But if we further increase the uh, ferromagnetic layers to a 3.4 nanometer, the uh, switching of the ferromagnetic layer become quite partial. And now we don't see the switching of the uh, exchange bias, which means if the spin uh, if the uh, ferromagnetic layer is too thick, the spin current cannot uh, reach this interface because it has been already abs uh, absorbed by the ferromagnet uh, layers. That's why we don't see the uh, uh, main, uh, exchange bias switching. So the whole idea is uh, uh, shown here. Uh, we generated a spin current in the platinum, and this kind of spin current passing through the cobalt or the ferromagnetic layer and reach this uh, interface of uh, antiferromagnet and the ferromagnet and give us the uh, uh, significant disturbance 
as this uh, interface and show the uh, 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 exchange bias switch. And one thing I would like to uh, uh, emphasize is that uh, <coughs> um, the uh, uh, spin orbital torque is actually the divergence of the spin current. So as you can imagine that uh, when the spin current passing through the ferromagnetic layers, the magnitude will become smaller and smaller. Well, but the, at the interface, as long as the relaxation in the ferromagnet and antiferromagnet is different, this interface indeed can give us enhanced spin orbital torque. And this kind of enhanced spin orbital torque, as I mentioned, it, it's, a, it, it's a very effective to disturb the, the interfacial spins so that we can see the uh, exchange bias uh, switching. Okay, and we would like to see uh, uh, more in-depth for this uh, uh, spin current behavior on the uh, uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnet. So again, we use uh, so-called the uh, uh, AP mode. So we have uh, uh, interfacial spin and uh, ferro ferromagnetic magnetization are uh, anti-parallel, but uh, uh, in the two different uh, configurations. And then we give the positive current and the positive HX. So in this case, we can switch the ferromagnetic uh, magnetization, but uh, without uh, changing the uh, antiferromagnetic interfacial spins. In this case, on the other hand, we actually uh, change the interfacial spins without uh, changing the ferromagnetic magnetization. So when we start to uh, in, uh, apply the spin current, you can see that uh, for ferromagnetic uh, switching, uh, it's the, the, the transition is uh, relatively sharp. Uh, I think we understand that the, the magnetization switch uh, reversal in the uh, ferromagnetic layers is uh, through the uh, uh, reversal domain formation and uh, uh, domain wall propagation. So the threshold of uh, uh, the current is uh, required uh, to uh, switch this uh, uh, magnetization. On the other hand, you can see that this is uh, exchange bias amplitude. You can see that uh, uh, this kind of free pin the interfacial uh, spins is accumulative. You can see this change is much more smooth, which means whenever we have a spin current running through the interface, we may partially change the spin structures for the antiferromagnet. So it's not uh, as sharp as these uh, uh, ferromagnetic uh, layers. Okay, so uh, in fact, uh, we can actually uh, independently uh, do the SOT switching for the ferromagnetic magnetization and exchange bias as I just described earlier. So we, we can either, you know, from here to here, we can either give the external field to switch this uh, uh, ferromagnetic uh, magnetization. And in this step, we use uh, SOT to switch the ferromagnetic uh, magnetization, but the, the antiferromagnetic interfacial spins are the same. And we also can change the interfacial spins so that uh, we change the uh, exchange bias direction. So we have uh, uh, different tuning knobs for the ferromagnetic layers as well as the interfacial spins. Um, people talk about the feel free. Of course, we can also have the feel free in this system. And here, different from the other people's re uh, results, we have uh, two unidirectional anisotropy. One is in the perpendicular direction. Another one, we actually anneal the system in the uh, uh, imprint field. So when we anneal the system in the, uh, anneal the device in the imprint direction, we build the uh, imprint exchange bias. But you can see that this is a hard axis. That's because cobalt proton has a very strong perpendicular anisotropy. So right now, in fact, we have a two unidirectional anisotropy in the system. So we can actually also use this kind of uh, uh, imprint built uh, exchange bias to give us the feel free switching as we observed here. Uh, in the last, last uh, 
uh, slides, I'm going to show you another uh, system, which is directly grow cobalt boron on top of the proton magnets. And this is the imprint system. So right now we have the imprint cobalt boron on top of the older, the L10 uh, proton magnets. And as you may know, proton magnets is also one very good uh, spin current source. So here you can see that the proton magnets uh, behave as anti ferro magnet as well as a spin current source. And interestingly, when we apply the, uh, uh, the, the current into the proton magnets, we can also switch the uh, exchange bias uh, from one direction to another. So here give us some, I think, uh, uh, more understanding we need, to, we need to know. In the previous system, we separate the uh, uh, spin current source, which is a proton. And we have an interferon magnet, eluding magnets, to pin the interfacial spins. But here you can see that the proton magnets itself have two functions. So it seems that the, the bulk of the proton magnets generated the spin current. And the interfacial spins of the proton magnets can be switched by this spin current. So I think that we have uh, more uh, experiments need to be done to uh, further understand this kind of system. Okay, let me give you the summary. So I hope that uh, I show you uh, clearly how we can use the uh, current poles to uh, uh, switch the exchange bias through the uh, spin orbital torque. And uh, uh, I hope that I convince you the dual heating indeed exist, existing, but it's not the major factor uh, for this kind of observed uh, spin uh, for this to observe the chain bias switching by the uh, uh, SOT. And uh, I think we observed that the SOT effects on the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet are not uh, exactly the same. So uh, I think that's kind of a challenge for us to you know, understand how the uh, spin current and the spin orbital torque uh, uh, affect the, the, the spin structures in the uh, antiferromagnet. magnet. Okay, I would like to acknowledge uh, my <coughs> students and uh, Professor Lin in the physics department and also the uh, funding uh, support. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>